just while we're getting the microphone uh, sorted out, I just give a brief introduction to Professor James Ladyman, who is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Bristol. And I'll preface my introduction by saying that some years ago, um, I was studying um, philosophy, my, my philosophy doctorate, and I noticed that many philosophers, um, they have a kind of toy model of science. It's a model of science that stopped in about 1850. And they're perfectly happy with that. Um, maybe they like Kant or something. Um, but anyway, that, that's the model that they, 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 they use, and um, there are perhaps very few philosophers who make a, a, a real effort to try to understand the developments in modern physics um, since that time. Of course, the reason what, uh, why that's not done is it's fundamentally hard. It's very hard to become uh, truly interdisciplinary, uh, skillful in an interdisciplinary way. Professor Ladyman, I think, will be, have some claim to be someone who succeeded in this area, and um, he's also a great communicator of science. Just to briefly list some of his awards. Um, he's won the, he was given the uh, Philip Lieberhume Prize in Philosophy of Ethics 2005. He's won um, an award from the American Library Association for the Outstanding Academic Text Award for Understanding the Philosophy of Science. He's co-editor of the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science. And he's honorary secretary of the British Society for the Philosophy of Science. He's um, published um, numerous papers and quite a few books. I have a copy of one of his books here. I see other people have got this as well. Um, uh, Everything Must Go, Metaphysics Naturalized, in which he's um, advocating what he calls ontic structural um, realism. Um, and uh, I have to say, I, I fully support his program, but I fully deny most of his conclusions. So we're going to have an interesting discussion later. So please welcome Professor James Ladyman. Uh, well, I'll start uh, with a quote from Poincaré. Um, Poincaré is a, um, a great physicist and mathematician, but also a sophisticated historian and philosopher of science. And uh, he was uh, an anti-atomist, an anti-realist, one of those who, at the end of the 19th century, uh, opposed the uh, atomistic program in physics. And uh, in 1913, he wrote a paper in which he changed his mind. Um, which, of course, we should applaud him for. Uh, it's always good to change your mind in the light of evidence. But um, the way in which he changed his mind is, is, is subtle and interesting, and that, that's going to provide the kind of... Uh, well, I, I thought I'd use these epigrams to, uh, to, to set the scene for what we'll talk about. So what he talks about here is uh, experiments by Perrin, which were, it, it, everyone will probably know, uh, look, m many independent ways of, of determining Avogadro's number, which were, and the fact that those different ways converged on the same number was, was what m made people really convert to atomism. And it's certainly what convinced Poincaré, as he said here. And um, he says that the atom of the chemist is now a reality. But, but, uh, this does not mean that we're about to arrive at the ultimate elements of matter. And um, I won't read out the whole quotation, but the... the that I would, be have, I would have nothing to say uh, were this last point not, not to have been vindicated by the progress of, of physics after the, the discovery of atoms. When he says here, this atom is a world. And that's really what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the implications of the fact that atoms turned out not to be fundamental. So here's my plan. I don't know if I'll... Uh, I always feel that... that, that um, I have to have lots and lots to say and then end up having far too much. Um, it, it's always the worry that uh, philosophical content will, will, will disappear when poked and there won't be anything there, so I can pack loads of stuff in a um, So uh, I'll say something about metaphysics and naturalism, and, and, and here I'll just advertise my position rather than arguing for it, really. And I'll sort of do the same thing with realism, how to read and structural realism, and then. Oh, well, then I'll do it again with things, and then I'll do it again with particles. So I won't give any arguments, I'll just tell you. <laughs> um, and maybe I'll have the other argument or two along the way. Um, all right, so what's metaphysics? Well, I guess everyone knows, you know, we say it's about the fundamental nature of reality. It's about being qua being. That's what Aristotle said rather than helpfully. Um, we, can, we can explain what metaphysics is perhaps best by just pointing to the kinds of things metaphysicians talk about. And... These are such matters as the ultimate nature of matter, the nature of space and time, causation, law, free will, the nature of mind, uh, God. Well, uh, you might then think immediately, well, 
Uh, doesn't science tell us about all those things? Is there any, is there any space for uh, an autonomous subject called, or for an autonomous subject, but a subject called metaphysics, in the light of the fact that science tells us about matter and space and time, and even uh, perhaps free will and minds? And um, what we've learned from science is that the distinction between appearance and reality that was first made by the ancient Greek atomists, I mean, I know it was first made by them, but certainly. You know, they very, very clearly articulated the thought that the properties of things that we observe in everyday experience in the manifest image are not necessarily uh, properties that inhere in those things objectively, that the true nature of those things may be very different, and those different natures give rise to appearances that make us think that things have certain properties like a taste or a smell or a colour, even though they in fact objectively don't. What they have is some other properties which give them a stable disposition to produce the properties that we, that we perceive in them. And um, it's tr true to say then that, that they just haven't really imagined quite how far removed the properties of the unobservable uh, atoms and other particles are from how, they seem in common, how things seem in common sense. Um, so, Given that, and, and given other, other areas of science in which we've learned that the universe is nothing like what we would have taken it to be like, so cosmology tells us it's much vaster than we could possibly have imagined, uh, much older than we could possibly have imagined, and evolutionary biology tells us all sorts of counterintuitive things about the relationship between species that we never would have expected to be true. Uh, this leads lots of people to think, look, uh, we can't know about the old, we can't answer metaphysical questions a priori. Uh, inquiry a priori will just tell us about how we think about things, and we know that how we think about things is derived from how they seem to us, and how they seem to us is radically at odds with how they are in lots of cases, so we better not rely upon that methodology. So what should we do? Well, naturalists say, well, we should look to science to determine our ontology, and then you might think, OK, so then why do we bother having metaphysics at all? And here's my positive uh, account of metaphysics, according to which it's not replaced or eliminated by science, even though it has to look to science. And the idea is, and here I quote a very unnaturalistic philosopher, Jonathan Lowe, uh, but I agree with what he says there. Um, but the person that really inspires uh, Don Ross and I to, to give this account of what metaphysics is, what naturalised metaphysics is, is Wilfred Sellers, who says that, the aim of, 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 of philosophers um, in general, metaphysicians in particular, is to know their way around with respect to the various special sciences, and they say something about how they fit together. And the point about that, uh, that task is it's not the job of any particular science to do that. And of course, lots of scientists engage in that activity, and uh, engage in it a lot in the popular press and popular books and popular discussions. So recently, uh, Lawrence Krauss, for example, has a, uh, the astronomer, ha uh, well, cosmologist, I guess, um, has uh, a book uh, advocating kind of reductionism and physicalism and so on. So he's there trying to do this job of saying something about how the sciences, as we have them, interrelate. So that's, according to us, what naturalized metaphysics is then. It's uh, what Sellers said, the attempt to say how things hang together, where uh, things is understood in the broadest possible sense of things, and hang together is understood in the broadest possible sense of hang together. Now, um, if we're going to take the sign of the image as our guide for uh, doing metaphysics, then we're clearly going to be what people call realist about the scientific image. Um, but there's a long tradition of saying that we shouldn't be realists about science. And it's not just philosophers. I mean, sometimes when you teach philosophy of science, I always imagine I'm teaching a kind of um, you know, merely philosophical position about science. And then I often find when I talk to scientists that they, 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 they tell me they're anti-realists. Um, so I, I don't know about the scientists here, but um, I gave a talk in the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory where they're very practical uh, people there. Um, not, not, not university scientists, but uh, technologists and so on. Uh, and um, I was really shocked when I said, OK, who's, who's kind of, I told them what realism was, what anti-realism was, and who's an anti-realist? And two-thirds, three-quarters of the audience uh, put their hands up and said they're anti-realist. Though they, they were a bit like, is there anyone from the research councils here? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
and they really did say that. Uh, uh, and, and, and here are some other scientists uh, advocating this view. I would say Stephen Hawking would have sold a lot less copies of the, a lot fewer, excuse me, copies of uh, Brief History of Time if this had been put on the back. Um, so they're, is, they're, they're saying the job of science is just to make predictions. But I think um, philosophers, I mean, and, if you, and if you don't find that position intelligible, then just think about what, what, what the sensible scientist's attitude to Newtonian mechanics is. It must just be, a, a, it, it proves, it's an existence proof for the possibility of, a, of a, an anti-realist position. Because you have to be an anti-realist about Newtonian mechanics, even if you use it every day, right? We know that Newtonian mechanics is, it, yes, it's superbly accurate. Um, Newton's data, the data available in the 17th century was accurate to one part in 10 to the 3, and the, um, for as far as the solar system goes, the theory is accurate to one part in 10 to the 6. So that's, that's super, but go beyond that, and it's, and it's not accurate. But with respect to its metaphysical commitments, you could say it's not even approximately accurate. I mean, it just, it just says all sorts of things that we don't any longer think are true. So the anti-realist position is, is a possible one to take, um, and, and there are many examples of particular models or parts of theories that people are, are explicitly anti-realist about. But philosophers are always persuaded, um, always moved by the, the, the so-called no miracles argument, uh, to be realists, uh, or at least to feel, feel they have to have something to say about why we, why we shouldn't be realists in the face of this argument, rather than realism just being um, you know, forgotten about. Well, the no miracles argument says um, when science makes novel predictions, like famously Einstein's prediction that we'd be able to see light that came from a star that's the other side of the sun because of the bending uh, of space-time, the fact that light travels in geodesics, not straight lines, um, that kind of prediction is, is not just about uh, recovering a, an accurate description of phenomena we already know about. It's predicting a qualitatively new kind of effect, which we would then look for and find. Um, other famous examples, uh, uh, the, the, the laser um, was, was uh, theoretically predicted, and then people spent a long time trying to m make it experimentally instantiated. No one would ever have suspected it could have happened without theory, but once the conditions were set up as the theory says, the phenomena uh, were as the theory says as well. So another famous example we talk about Fresnel's um, white spot at the centre of the shadow of an opaque disk. Um, completely astonishing prediction that you really wouldn't think would happen if the theory wasn't true. It's supposed to make you think, okay, so there must be something to the theory. The theory couldn't be getting this right unless it was tracking the deep nature of reality. Um, the laser was called um, by Charles Towns after it was finally successfully built a solution in search of a problem. And um, it was many, many years before people um, realized what to do with it. And this is why the impact agenda is absolutely ridiculous and will damage science so badly. Okay, so um, the, um, I'll give you another example about the impact agenda later if I, if I remember. The problem of theory change is the argument that pulls in the opposite direction. The problem of theory change says, yeah, no, it's all really it's good, but look, think of the example you gave, Fresnel's white spot. There is no such thing as the elastic solid ether, according to our best physics. And yet Fresnel used principles that apply to solids to, de to derive the equations that would govern transverse wave motion in such a, a medium. And so this is supposed to show that we can't believe that when a theory makes novel predictions, it, that's evidence that the theory is, is telling us about the deep nature of reality, because we have all these examples where the subsequent science has shown there's no such thing, the ether, caloric, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps others. Um, well, John Worrell um, rehabilitated the position of Poincaré, um, so he's a hero of this talk in lots of ways, um, had advocated a long time ago. And, uh, I remember going to um, philosophy of science lectures at the, at the LSE that began with Elie Zahar saying, I'm going to talk to you about Pierre Duhem and Henri Poincaré because everything important in 20th century philosophy of science was already said by then. And that may be uh, an overstatement, um, but nonetheless it is true that these, um, 
great uh, physicists and historians of science, philosophers of science at the turn of the 19th, 20th century, uh, wrote, wrote work replete with insights. And um, both of them have been claimed by Worrell as structural realists, um, despite the fact that actually they say different things and um, it's, it, uh, it's problematic. Um, in any case, um, the idea of structural realism is to say, OK, um, we want some middle ground. And it's a fairly obvious thing to say, I guess. We have two arguments. One calls us to be realists. The other calls us to be anti-realists. We're rational people. We have to take account of both. So we need some kind of position <coughs> that, that um, is, has a bit of realism and a bit of anti-realism. Now, whether or not, you know, as always, um, it's like um, perhaps um, uh, you know, people say about secular humanism, um, you know, does it really exist? Um, I think in, in philosophy, we all want to be non-reductive physicalists. You know, just because a position would be good if you could hold it, doesn't mean that the position is really coherent and stable and you can sustain it. But nonetheless, this is the idea. There's this middle ground position, structural realism. And structural realism points to the fact that even on radical ontological theory change, where we move from the elastic solid ether to Maxwell's electromagnetic field, or from uh, the caloric theory of heat to the kinetic theory of heat, there's still a, a retention of theoretical structure. And there's a, that, by that, I mean a retention of more than the purely empirical content of the theory. And there are many such examples. Um, so here are some others. Uh, the Galilean group of transformations comes as a limit when the, um, uh, you take the ratio of the speed, the relative velocity to the speed of light to zero. Uh, there are all sorts of limiting relationships in the values of heuristic and the development of quantum mechanics to have a correspondence principle to say, okay, in the limit as the number of particles gets large or as the quantum of action becomes irrelevant, becomes effectively zero, we should recover classical mechanics. Uh, general relativity doesn't just recover the empirical predictions of, of Newtonian gravitation, it recovers the Poisson equation, uh, which expresses the inverse square law of, of Newtonian uh, gravitation. So the point about all these examples is more than the empirical, purely empirical content is recovered. And an example I like because um, it's not from physics, and people have often said, oh, structuralism is no, all right from physics, but it's no good for other bits of science, is phlogiston theory, uh, which uh, sometimes is dismissed as you know, just bad science. In fact, you see the popular um, TV show with Jim Alcalini talking about phlogiston theory. He says, he presents it as, you know, they thought all this nonsense, and then Lavoisier came along and, and sorted it all out. But in fact, there was lots of truth in phlogiston theory. Um, namely that, and I, I would say it's relational structural truth, uh, it, the fact that uh, there are two kinds of, of reaction that are reciprocal to each other, and that respiration and calcination of metals and ordinary combustion are all, all instances of one of those kinds of reaction. That's retained in contemporary chemistry. Um, and indeed, when I gave a talk about this in the chemistry department in Bristol, someone said it was just obvious that phlogiston was electrons. Um, so and I'm not endorsing that view, but nonetheless, um, making the point that one can make sense of these past scientific theories, one's sensible about it, one sees that where they had empirical content, they were also getting something right at, at a deeper level than the in, empirical content. Um, so by empirical content, I just mean that they, they say things like, you know, if you put a, a, a small mammal in a chamber in which you previously allowed a candle to um, Burn, burn itself out, then the mammal won't be able to breathe. I mean, that's the empirical content. But then the, the deeper, I mean, there's a famous picture in the um, uh, National Gallery, of course, of the evacuated um, bell jar with the, um, I think it's a chicken in that, a chick in that case. Um, but that's the empirical content, but the, but the theoretical content is, is, is saying, that, and that, that there's this single kind of reaction uh, phlogistication or dephlogistication, and uh, what we now, what we, what we call, what was called uh, dephlogistication is, is, is what we now call oxidation. Okay, so uh, there's more than the retention of empirical generalization, so more than, more than just a structuralism about empirical content is warranted. Now, um, when I started working on structural realism, my, my PhD was Stephen French. I, I was very excited by this paper by John Worrell. I wanted to understand what it, 
what he was saying, and the, I thought, well, there's two ways you could read what he's saying. You could read what he's saying, if you take the claim that all we know about the world is structure, you could take that to say, well, as he does, that, uh, there's this realm of unobservable objects, and then we don't know about them directly, we just know about their, their relations. Or you could take more, and that's uh, that epistemic structuralism because it just says that structuralism comes at the epistemological level. There's a more radical view that says, no, well, there's some lesson here about fundamental ontology that actually the world doesn't come in the form of some fundamental set of little objects at all. And we have to rethink ontology, ontology in structuralist terms or in relationist terms. And that's the view that I've tried to make sense of and, and defend over quite a few years now. And the reason why I prefer that view is because, um, well, various reasons, but one is because I think it fits with the implications of current physics. And so that's what I want to say something little about. Um, so forgetting about the theory change point now, and just thinking about the ontology of current physics, the idea is that there's a, um, well, the claim I've defended is the kind of uh, consilience argument, okay? So several different considerations or considerations in different domains pushing us in the same direction. And the direction we're supposed to be being pushed in is a structuralist or relationist uh, direction. And the two domains that I'm thinking about in the first instance are that of uh, general relativity and quantum mechanics. So I'll say something about those, forget about the first thing, I'll just say something about those two first. So the idea is that quantum mechanics uh, uh, the way that quantum particles are understood uh, is incompatible with thinking them of them as, as uh, well, I mean, this is what exactly what it means by this difficult, but some Dobbin said they're incompatible with thinking of them as individuals, and I'll get on to that in a moment. Um, but the, the real point is that insofar as they are objects or individuals, they, their, their properties depend on their relations to each other. And the um, mention of entanglement and the Aronoff Bohm effect is supposed to, um, is, is that this is the evidence I'm talking about. So if you have uh, two electrons in an entangled state, let's say the uh, two electrons in the first orbital of the helium, helium atom, then they have exactly the same spatial wave function. And they, uh, they satisfy the Pauli exclusion principle and, and therefore, therefore have different properties. Only in the sense that they are in the singlet state of spin, which says, well, uh, if you ever measure them in a particular direction of spin, you will find one to be up and one to be down. But you can't, for complicated reasons, you can't straightforwardly attribute them a definite spin such that one's up and one's down prior to that measurement. So the most natural thing to say is, well, they're in this entangled state, which is such that one will be up, one will be down if they're both measured in the same direction, but it's not because one is determinately up and one is determinately down. Uh, the Harold bohm effect is about the fact that uh, if you have uh, a solenoid and um, you stick it in the middle of an interference apparatus uh, and pass a, 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 a field, that there can be a field inside the solenoid, uh, no field outside the solenoid, and yet you get a phase shift in the uh, uh, state of the electrons that are propagating in the interference apparatus. And that means either that the field inside the solenoid is non-locally acting upon the electrons, or more plausibly, that um, the, 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 the quantum potential, sorry, that the uh, electromagnetic potential is, is a real entity, and that is, and that is acting locally, and is non-zero outside the solenoid, but its state at any point in space is not independent of, it, of the uh, behavior of the electromagnetic field elsewhere, and to have a kind of non-separability. Um, okay, and in general relativity, we have diffeomorphism invariance, which means that um, models of space-time are only given up to a possible permutation of space-time points. 
And so we can think of the uh, of space-time points as individuated only up to the metrical relations that they stand in to other space-time points. Okay, so saying a little bit about um, uh, this, this, this stuff I, I kind of skipped over quickly because I've, I've talked about it and written about it so much for so many years and so many other people have that even if you aren't all totally familiar with it, I didn't really feel like it, I could just come and talk about it all, all over again. Um, so I'm really kind of advertising uh, this, this area and, and there's a, a, a huge literature um, which Catherine Hawley has also contributed to. Um, and I want to get on to talk about something that I haven't talked about so much before. Um, so that's why I'm skipping over it a bit quickly. Um, but this is certainly the received view, anyway, among physicists um, ever since the, the advent of quantum statistics. Uh, Schrodinger says, look, particles don't have individuality. Herman Weyl says the same thing. And I think there's been a lot of debate about this, and the now current, current state of play is you know, they may be individuals, depending on what exactly you mean by individuals, but if they are individuals, then they are individuated in part by their relations to each other, and, and you can't think of them as self-subsistent, freestanding little entities. And so this really is, um, is where this title of the book, Everything Must Go, comes from. Um, I actually don't really think everything must go at all. I mean, it's just a, a catchy title. But um, <laughs> what's, what's lying behind that is the thought that there are things, there are all sorts of things around us. Um, that it does make sense to describe the world in terms of individuals and their properties and relations. But from a metaphysical point of view, we can't think of the world as decomposing <laughs> some privileged set of individual things and then regard the relations between them as supervenient, as, as determined by those things' intrinsic properties. And that is the, the natural way to think about things, and the idea is that we've been brought to think in a different way because of uh, the astonishing discoveries of, of, of fundamental physics. So, I'm going to say something about composition and scale. When am I supposed to finish, by the way? Another ten minutes. Another ten minutes? Five, five, five minutes. Five, ten minutes. Five minutes? Okay, I'll speed up then. <laughs> Uh, okay, so up to a point. So ten, ten. Okay, up to a point. Um, <laughs> up, up to a point, we seem to be able to understand the world as composed of smaller spatial parts, and I think this is like how we we, we, we want to be able to visualise things, right? And the ancient Greek atomists were still in the business of visualising things, and that's how, why I say that they just didn't imagine quite how different appearance and reality are. Because when they visualise things, they thought, oh yeah, those little atoms don't have colour or they don't have taste. But they still thought, yeah, but they're like little particles, right? And I don't think that's how we should think about reality in the light of fundamental physics. I think that we can't really visualise what reality is fundamentally like at all. And at a certain point in learning physics, you must simply defer to your mathematical description. And you, you, what, what's making us come up unstuck so much in metaphysics is the insistence that we be able to visualize and describe the fundamental nature of reality in terms of the conceptual resources which we get from, uh, from intuition, from common sense, from our evolutionary endowed sort of uh, cognitive apparatus. Right? Um, certainly, the world that we deal with uh, on a daily basis is one in which it is very helpful to think in terms of enduring, relatively independent physical objects with determinate spatio-temporal properties that are independent of each other and so on. But physics puts pressure on that view, and why should we really think that uh, how things are fundamentally is something that we should be able to visualize or <coughs> imagine or describe? I mean, that, that's, that's why we have mathematics, because it, it enables us to transcend those uh, limitations. So what we've learned, I think, is that reality is not scale invariant. The, the subatomic world is not like a kind of shrunk down version of the, of the macroscopic world. Uh, nature seems to care about length scales, energy scales, and velocity. And I think that philosophers have really um, thought about composition in the wrong way. Because they think about composition in, in synchronic terms. That is to say, they, they think about it in terms of sort of uh, 
in parts composing wholes through some kind of relation that they bear to each other at a time, whereas in fact, composition in science is really always dynamic and uh, diachronic. So I do think that things really do hang together, and that's why we can do metaphysics, because although science gives us ontologies at many different levels, uh, quarks and, and leptons, atoms, molecules, uh, cells, organisms, social groups, societies, markets, uh, whatever. Um, nonetheless, um, and, and, and although I think that neither theoretical nor ontological reductionism is plausible for, for, for most, of that, most of those ontologies, you just won't find a way of translating talk about the higher level ontology into talk about the lower level ontology. Nonetheless, science is unified, and where um, the sciences overlap, they must be coherent, they must be consistent. And um, we see this, I mean, there's a lot of talk these days about pluralism and the disunity of science. And I think you know, it's, it's really underestimated the extraordinary degree of unification that we have in the scientific image. Um, if you just think about the ubiquity of the periodic table classification of the elements and how that informs and underlies so much <coughs> of the rest of the physical sciences. Um, science is unified, but, but reductionism is false. So what, what more can we say? Well, that's what I think the really interesting question is for naturalized metaphysics. That's what people should be studying. They should be trying to understand what, uh, and lots of people are studying it, um, what is the relationship between the sciences that illuminates the, the, the fact that the sciences are as they are? And, and, and uh, okay. Okay, so I'd like to offer you a definition of fundamental physics that's all, uh, uh, other than, uh, in, in different terms, that, you know, fundamental physics tells us about what the ultimate building blocks of matter are. I think that's a really bad way to think, think about things. Matter is not the kind of thing that has building blocks, and thinking about things in terms of building blocks is just thinking about things in terms of some privileged set of fundamental individuals and then building everything out of them. That's not how reality is. So what's fundamental physics? Well, it's a kind of maximally general science. All the other sciences apply in restricted domains. And physics, the fundamental physics, aspires to transcend all such limitations, to, to be true and testable at every scale, everywhere in the universe. Um, there are many places in the universe where the laws of biology have, uh, are, are not testable. Um, but, uh, but physics isn't like that. It has implications for everything. Fundamental physics does. I keep saying fundamental physics because many parts of physics are special sciences in this sense, right? Obviously, um, optics or condensed matter physics or uh, fluid mechanics. These are, these, are, these are special sciences in this sense. So what we have is putatively fundamental physics. And so far, we haven't finished. And this was Pankaray's point. Right? Just as he said, this atom is a world, uh, well, at so far, at every level that we've managed to, to which we've managed to penetrate, we've just found more structure. And, um, you know, the kind of, you know, was this a period in particle physics where people thought, okay, we've got protons and neutrons and electrons, and then the so-called particle zoo was found, right? And there's suddenly a lot more ons to keep track of. Um, and, but yet, I say, um, that physics is kind of defined by this aspiration to fundamentality. Even if it never reaches it, 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 it has it as a limiting ideal. Um, and, and the point is this, that in fundamental physics, you're just not permitted to invoke entities or processes from a higher level as part of an explanation of what's going on. But in every other science, you can. So, um, the economy, you know, it's no problem looking at a graph of the stock market and then saying, oh, you see that big spike there? That was, that there was, a, it was a, an earthquake or there was a, a war broke out. Or, well, that's a, a social factor. No, there's some physical fact that affect the stock market, right? Equally, living systems can be affected by radiation. Chemical reactions can be affected by mag magnetic fields. Chemistry isn't self-contained, you know. It's not, only, it's not that you can only talk about chemical causes for ch chemical effects. But fundamental physics isn't like that. You must always, in principle, be able to explain what's going on without reference to anything higher up. And that's what I think of as the correctness of reductionism, um, is that there is this asymmetry between fundamental physics and everything else. 
Um, but, um, but, 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 it, but it's not an asymmetry as in where everything is, is really made out of the physical or everything's reducible to the physical or, any, or anything like that. This is a weaker kind of physicalism, but it's still a, a, a kind of physicalism. In, in science, uh, the higher level, and I'm going to tell you something about my story with Don Ross about what, how uh, special science ontology relates to fundamental physics. And um, the idea is, look, think about how special science explanations and descriptions work. What we do is we throw away a certain amount of detail in order to massively reduce the complexity of the problem. We coarse grain and we make approximations. And it's an interesting uh, and amazing and lucky fact about the world that, that we can do it. And that we find, my favorite example being um, 10 to the 23 odd degrees of freedom in uh, the particles of the, uh, uh, in this room, um, pretty well described by three degrees of freedom in the ideal gas laws. And it's an astonishing reduction in the number of degrees of freedom needed to describe the physical system in question. And this is how uh, it always goes. So we look for some kind of universal form of behavior um, which allows us to forget some of the detail about the underlying level, but the price of doing so is we only ever get a statistical sort of aggregative, aggregative accurate description with respect to that lower level. Okay, so I'm going to hurry up. So we call this in our book the scale relativity of ontology, a view. Uh, our view is similar to the view advertised by Alan Sokal and um, Jean Brippon, which they call the renormalization group view of the world. Um, and I'll just hurry up. So I want to say something about particles and then I'll stop. Okay, so the, so the special sciences are possible because the world is to some extent algorithmically compressible. Uh, and Daniel Dennett has this view where he says to be is to be a real pattern, and this is a view that we, we take up. And if you want to know more about it, then if you don't want to read my book, you could read Dennett, Dennett's paper, Real Patterns, which uh, has been quite influential on a lot of scientists, I think. Um, these real patterns are real, they're there. The ideal gas laws are, 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 are true of the world. If you don't, if you don't spot which coarse graining to make or which approximation to make, you won't see them and you'll be missing something real about the world. That, that, this, um, that, 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 that there are projectable laws and generalizations stateable in terms of, a, of, of some uh, more approximate coarse grain ontology. Okay, so um, this is the negative thesis. Everything must go in the sense that the world is not made of little things, in the sense of little material objects as modeled by intuition, and as we see in the mathematics image, particles, not particles. But since, um, and there's a positive thesis, I'm really going to speed up now. But since writing this book, I realized I was being really rude to loads of philosophers for not understanding enough about science. And at the same time, I was almost completely relying upon uh, many particle non relativistic quantum mechanics and general relativity. And so I spent the last few years trying to learn about quantum field theory and particle physics. And to, to you know, uh, lest anybody say to me, you said you have to know about science and you don't. And I just like to joke that. I uh, still don't know anything about quantum field theory, but I'm much better at telling when someone else is bullshitting about quantum field theory than I was before. <laughs> and, and that's because quantum field theory is so incredibly hard. But uh, what I've learned so far, I think, sort of supports the rough kind of view that uh, we, uh, we, we gave in our book. So um, I, the, the key thing was this idea of diachronic composition. Now, philosophers are always talking about water is H2O. But, uh, there are whole books written about water, as I'm sure some of you know. And what they, what they tell you is that the, the, the familiar properties of water depend on the uh, equilibria in the formation and dissolution of polymeric chains of H2O molecules because of hydrogen bonding. So water is really a bit of H2O2 and a bit of H2O3 and a bit of H2O4. And it's about the dynamics of how those things form and unform and interact. That make, that's what makes water water, not the mere aggregation of a couple of H's and an O. And now I'll say a little bit about particles. So particles exist when they're affected by degrees of freedom that behave like particles. Lots of particles aren't elementary. And in a sense, what I want to say is all particles are quasi-particles. So there's a big list of quasi-particles. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Quarks and hadrons. Um, in high energy collisions of electrons and neutrons, quarks hardly interact. And this, uh, uh, the, the thing I think is interesting is uh, this. The bound state of quarks that we call the proton has a mass of 938 MeV. 
The component quarks have combined mass of about 15 MeV. So I think really quarks, you don't think quarks aren't the building blocks of matter at all. They're structural principles that give rise to the structural properties of protons, but the massiness of protons, their substance, well, that comes from gluon balls, uh, which are, and how they interact. And that's about the dynamics of the strong force, not about, uh, uh, not, you know, don't get it by thinking about some synchronic conception of what is inside the quark. And um, other example is um, pions. Uh, the lightness example, because pions were discovered in Bristol um, when high energy physics um, sort, of, sort of began, and uh, Cecil Powell got the Nobel Prize, and that was in the days when physics uh, you needed a Land Rover to do physics because you had to set up a hot air, uh, air balloon and put photographic plates in it, and then it'd be exposed to cosmic rays, and it would land somewhere in sunset, and you'd have to drive up and find it. And Cecil Powell um, could have put on his pathways for impact statement, um, this will be why uh, in many years' time there will be a balloon fiesta that will contribute loads to the economy in Bristol because of this work. Um, because that has been one of the major impacts of that work, and of course it's completely ludicrous to predict that that could happen. Okay, so um, uh, in, in, in this theory, you set the, the, the pi on mass to zero, even though it's of the order of 139 MeV, and the energy per nucleon released in nuclear fission is about 10, 10 MeV. But you're saying that is effectively zero. Anyway, so I'll, I'll, I'll nearly finish. So basically, you can write down in the Lagrangian in terms of pi on degrees of freedom. That gives you an empirically adequate description of some phenomena. So that's what it is to say that pions are genuine particles. And, uh, well, I think that it's all kind of like that. <laughs> Thank you. So, sorry for speeding up on that. I hope at least of the other property questions. Very grateful indeed. Um, before I talk, and also for Professor Layton just for getting here, um, uh, so explain what we're going to do now. It's going to be sort of ever increasing circles. So, um, Ray invited me to uh, ask a few questions uh, to Professor Layton. I've been interested in his work for a long time. We've had some discussions about this. <coughs> so, I'll, I'll ask uh, three questions. Um, and then we'll open up the um, uh, open it up to everyone to ask questions of him. And then we'll invite back all our speakers, I think that's the idea, to the front, um, for a big panel discussion uh, to finish off. Just to get in time check, um, we were just thinking, when we've got to get when we've got to get this stuff. We get epistemology bit to begin. <laughs> Five. So, so if we have the all panel together, perhaps in ten minutes, is that fine? Fine. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, I'll begin actually after your slight apologies. Although I said I disagreed with your work, I think I disagreed with the marketing of your work because when I started to read it, it was very because everything must go. As I started to absorb it, um, then I found I agreed with much more than I expected. But there are a couple of points I'll just just pick you up on. Um, and one of the things is where you make this commitment about um, reality and information. And you quote uh, uh, Zeylinger, um, I think uh, a firm that you quote him in a, in a way that says you, know, you agree with him, that um, it is impossible to distinguish operationally in any way reality and information. And the notion of the two being distinct should be abandoned. I'm trying to think of a possible counterexample for that. And I was thinking of the example of really vicious cases in fluid dynamics. So let's say something like the gas swirling around Jupiter, or water coming out of a tap. Now the water isn't calculating where it needs to go next. Um, the gases of Jupiter don't sort of perform these fantastic integrals to decide you know, where they're going to switch to the, um, uh, move in the next instant. That just happens because they're stuff, they're, they're matter. Um, and we now know, particularly when we looked at the stripped down version of this problem in, in complex systems and the Lorentz equation, that um, we cannot compute the end state of the system from the initial state. It's as if the initial information is destroyed and new information is created in the form of a strange factor in complex systems. So the bottom line seems to be that matter matters. It's not just about information, because there are more and more mechanical systems now where it's, 
we can't actually connect past, present, and future purely through information, abstract information alone. I don't know if this is something that you've um, been thinking about. If you've got any comments on that, I'd be very grateful. Right, thank you. That's a really good question. Um, so, I actually, I mean, you, you, you're very, very astute to find that quote, but I, I kind of regret the way that you put that, that quote in, and so I'll just, I'll just backtrack it for a bit. Um, so, what I now think is that there's kind of two ways to think about um, how, how higher order ontology comes about. And one is in terms of information and compression, and, and that's the real patterns way of thinking about it. And the other is in terms of um, if, uh, in other words, what coarse grainings of your more fundamental set of variables give rise to an uh, interesting dynamics. And I think of those as kind of alternatives, and so I don't think of the information way of thinking about things as mandatory. But um, I still, I mean, one of the things that comes up a lot in the, the discussion of the book is people saying, well, it can't just be all pure structure, because pure structure is just like mathematics, and, the, you know, the difference between mathematics and physics is you can kind of bump into the table. Um, so there must be more than just pure structure there. And I obviously, agree, um, but I think that attempts to say what that difference consists in will lead you into just empty metaphysical postulates. Um, and so it's kind of idle to and it's idle, idle to talk about what the materialness of matter consists in. It definitely doesn't consist in extension in space. And, and so what, what does it consist in? I don't know. I mean, there is a difference between instantiated kind of structure and uninstantiated structure. But, you know, it, I, I, I want to say that's just brute because I think saying anything else is opening the door to interminable um, metaphysical theorizing with no, um, which will be then free floating and have no connection to, to any empirical project. It's interesting that, that's a very interesting response. Um, uh, it's interesting that the medievals used to refer to matter as being the, the thing that allows substantial change. Right. So, it's, but, but itself couldn't be defined formally, so that would defeat the purpose. It would become form and then information. So, so it's kind of a remainder uh, concept, you might say. Yeah, that's okay, so, good. So, so if you want, I mean, I, I do think there is a remainder, possibly. I mean, look, Max Tegmark floats this view that, that in fact the universe is mathematical and everything that's, you know, all mathematical structure is instantiated. And I, I'm kind of agnostic about that. So I don't want to, I mean, I think in our book we're kind of, we, 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 we're agnostic about Pythagoreanism, but uh, I don't want to, I don't want to, but we don't commit to it, so yeah. Okay. Just one other, um, just a couple more questions. Um, one, one which is, I wondered really whether you, you slightly defeated your own case. I was actually finding I was going to ask you about the Raymond's quarks, and then you suddenly flashed up those slides. So that's very, that's very providential. Um, but um, if it applies to quarks, why not to other things as well? So if, if um, the rest mass of a Raymond's quark isn't really a well-defined concept, it's only as part of the whole, why could you not say that for other levels of being as well? So for example, the, the atom on the top of a horn of a, of a galloping rhinoceros is not um, behaving uh, not obeying the uh, laws of physics, that she's sort of uh, following the pattern of the rhinoceros. But, but you claim that physics, uh, there's an asymmetry between physics and the other special sciences, mm -hmm. and yet the cork hadron example almost seems to slightly undermine that case, because the hadron seems to be more important than the cork to which it's composed. Oh, well, um, no, I don't think that's right, because I think, so for example, when you, I mean, you, I'm sure people here know a lot more about this than I do, but when, um, these Lagrangians are written down for in effective field theory, and you, you pretend that some uh, degrees of freedom are fundamental, but you have an underlying theory that says, well, in fact, that, that, um, that, that there's a deeper, deeper structure. You can, you, you always, or pretty much always, add corrections to the higher level description based on your understanding of the lower level. And so that's what I mean about the failure of reductionism and not of the unity of science. It's sort of like the higher level looks like it's autonomous in one sense. So you, you, you find genuine laws, genuine interactions, genuine, um, a genuine Lagrangian that's empirically adequate. 
But nonetheless, you, you, it's required to be coherent and consistent with your underlying description. And the, and the, and the fact that the underlying description um, is more fundamental comes out in the, in the possibility of doing a perturbation theory based on adding corrections from your understanding of the underlying physics. Um, now, how that exactly relates to... So, yeah, and so I would say that's... You know, we have a story about why the hadron is like it is in terms of the underlying physics because we have a theory of the gluon interactions and how they, they, they can give rise to uh, mass in, in the hadron. Um, so, I don't think it underlines that. Yeah, so well, one will, will, I suppose, touch on whether the quark has any reality outside the context of the uh, of the habit since it cannot exist as a free particle, that sort of thing. Right, okay, well, I mean, I, I mean I'm kind of skeptical about talk about, I, I, I almost think that there's a danger when, when so, so you, you remark about the atom on the tip of the rhinoceros is formed. I mean, what that means, lots of people say, is that they want to make a stronger form of anti reductionism than I do by having kind of downwards causation, and that's exactly the kind of example they give. They say, look, I decide to go for a walk. There's an atom on my finger. Um, I, when I decide to go for a walk, the atom comes with me. So isn't that downwards causation, my mental state, causing movement of this atom? Um, now, I, about that, I would say um, it's kind of a muddle to bring... Uh, I, I mean, this is really tricky and difficult, and I don't want to pretend I've really sorted that out, and I think this is precisely what we should be thinking about and trying to understand. But I think that I won't, I'm not happy with the idea of downwards causation, because I think that in every case that we've ever been able to study using a more underlying science, we've found a, a reason for the atom to move at that level. So um, the issue comes about the compatibility of those two levels of causation, but would say, well, no, look, you know, there's no need to talk about the atom being moved by my decision to go for, go, go for a walk. Um, one can explain the movement of atoms at the atomic level, and we'll never need to, once we once we set about describing them at that level, we won't need to bring in anything from a higher level. And, you know, if we did, we would we would get violations of our more underlying physics um, because of it, and we don't. So. But I, I think that's particularly satisfactory. I mean, I think this is, a, as, as I say, I think that's a really difficult problem. I think I don't really, don't really know quite what it is. Thank you. I mean, I'd love to ask more, but I, I think I better not be selfish. And uh, just wonder, do you have any other questions? Or should we go straight to the panel? Or, or maybe just a few questions generally. So. Actually, a few folks said yeah, yes. Just yes. Just five yes. minutes. So is that right? Any questions? Yes. Having now read your book, I was expecting also to hear a sort of reduction in our ontological commitments from your talk, but it seemed quite the opposite. If I understand you right, you're willing to allow that science gives us ontologies at different levels, and so among the things that exist, you included not only leptons and hadrons, but also at one level societies and markets and so forth which seems to me quite ontologically generous. Do you have a criterion of ontological commitment? Right. What do our best scientific theories commit us to? Will they commit us to abstract uh, mathematical objects, for example? No, that's a very good question. As I said, that's a question we should continually dodge all the way through the book, the last <laughs> question, about, about abstractor. But the, but the first question we don't, we are explicitly, we say, to be a still real pattern. And so our criterion of ontological commitment is if quantifying over something gives you projectable uh, law, well, by projectable I just mean laws that are predictive and support counterfactuals and are explanatory and so on, uh, then whatever you're quantifying over is, a gen is worthy of being on logical commitment. And so, that, in a sense, what we end up doing is being very deflationary about ontology, and uh, there's just no further question as to whether something exists than whether it's, it's indispensable in a, in a description uh, that uh, allows you to write down laws uh, or, or cause irregularities. Um, and obviously that's a matter of degree to some extent. So, um, you, so, so you, you will sometimes, well, let's say we could quantify over um, 
You can't solve it over, over ravens. And we can state all sorts of generalizations about the individual birds just by talking about ravens now and uh, having the kind. But we could also have corva, which is the genus. And the, there will be a sort of further trade-off there, right? We'll, we'll get some uh, extra simplicity, but lose some, uh, some generality and some, sorry, lose some precision. And um, <coughs> I think it's kind of a matter of degree, but where, where you simply aggregate entities and then aggregate your description, that's not sufficient for, you won't have an ontological commitment to the aggregative description. But where you're, when you cause grain, you get a new level of description that gives you a massively simpler law, then that's a reason to be ontologically committed. And so, yeah, I, I am ontologically quite, um, well, 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 yeah, a plural, I mean, I'm happy to have, have the ontology of any, any genuine science. And what makes it count as genuine science is exactly just what scientists say something counts as a genuine science, right? When you really have, have laws and causal regularities that are, that are projectable and uh, explanatory. Any other questions? Yes. I'd like to say something more about composition. You, you talked about it rather than being synchronic, it's dynamic and diachronic. And really, I want to get a grip on the, what it was you were denying there. Right? So you, you talked about the way in which when things hang together, that's typically as a result of kind of processes that change over time and different sort of systems and so on. Yeah. I mean, what's the contrast there? What, what is it that you think that, that is being mistakenly thought by, by other philosophers? Oh, I see. Well, I, I mean, I'm going to go around that very, very quickly, but well, one consequence of it is going to be that, that I mean, this is about scale relativity, but it won't make sense to talk about um, a cat at the nano scale or over a very short scale of time. That that really won't exist as an entity at that level of description. And so, uh, and so likewise, I would say for, so, so the idea is, um, if you want to understand how cells compose an organism, then you need to understand how they interact with each other. And it, the special sciences have their characteristic time and length scales. And in particular here talking about time scale, interactions take place over characteristic time scales. And uh, you, so what I'm arguing against is a kind of conception um, where you just simply put all the parts in you know, together spatially and then somehow you're wondering, or when do they compose a whole? Um, it's, well, the parts have to be interacting, and those kinds of interactions will take place over time. And so these parts are composing a whole when they're interacting with each other in the right kind of way over, the, over, and, uh, over a, a certain amount of time, not, not at an instant. And so I think, that's why I think that there's sort of, we get pseudo problems if we think about it the other way. So I think the problem of exactly which atoms are part of me is a, is a pseudo problem. Um, there, there is, I am, I am a, a, a real pattern that emerges through the interaction of things. Um, there's just, I am not identifiable with some set of, of atoms. So, but, so the cat exists for a period of time, and it exists throughout that time, are you not? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, for example, an ecosystem or something, right? You know, it, it just doesn't make sense to talk about, you know, well, when we had this ecosystem and it came into existence for a nanosecond and then went out of existence again, we're like, no, no, sorry, if it was only around for a nanosecond, it wasn't an ecosystem. Because e being an ecosystem is constituted by interactions among parts that have to take less place over longer time scales than that. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think Peter Manningham could agree with you. I think, yeah. Okay, but, but I mean, maybe it's just a matter of emphasis then, but I, I, sure. I don't see dynamics or interaction or diachronic conceptions of, uh, of composition being discussed much. I tend to see people talking about some fundamental set of symbols and asking about some abstract relation of, of them form, forming a whole. And I don't think that relation is a, 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 a philosophical, a metaphysical composition relation. I think composition is to be understood via interactions and then 
What kind of interactions? Well, the kind of interactions that are studied by the relevant bit of science. Uh, so, for example, the markets are constituted by, by economic agents engaged in transactions. Those are the relevant kind of interactions for markets. But there's a constraint from fundamental physics because nothing can propagate in markets faster than we would like to say. Okay, sorry. Okay, so, 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 so let me thank James for his